Jack Parsons and Ben Towers. Uh, welcome to New Zealand. And Michael Barnett from the Auckland Business Chamber. Thank you for speaking with us. Jack, if I, could, if I could begin with you, just 25 and already named top 50 kindest leader in the UK, most connected young entrepreneur in 17, 18 and 19, younger, youngest digital leader of year 2017. The, the accolades go on and you're only 25. Tell us a little bit about your journey, how you came to be in that situation, so young in your life. So for me, I grew up on a council estate. My mum was only ever in free moods, drunk, violent or asleep. And I used to go home and I grew up very quickly because it was my job to be the adult in the room. It was my job to make sure that we had food on the table and it was my job to make sure that she was okay. And I used to go to school and school was a place for me to be quiet, a place for me to fit in because that's what you're meant to do in this lovely world is to fit in. And every time I tried to fit in, I didn't fit in. So. Leaving school, I didn't really get my GCSEs. What do I do next? So I got myself an apprenticeship. I did this apprenticeship and it was a sales apprenticeship. And my job was to call random numbers and ask them if they've got a driving license. And if they said yes to that, transfer them over to the big boys table. And I did that and I wasn't good at it. I really wasn't good at phoning up random numbers and asking them, to, to sell them, asking them they want a cheaper quote. But I had a sense of purpose. Turning up to that room every day gave me a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging. And after completing my apprenticeship, I then moved into a recruitment role, putting teachers into jobs. And for me, I was like, right, if I can put the right teachers into the right jobs, just maybe we may be able to get the teachers to give the right advice to the young people. From that, I was there for three and a half years and I learned everything I could about business and I went on to set up my first adventure which was focused on diversity and inclusion and it was focused on getting young people from council estates just like me into big corporates. I, I run that business for four years, grew it to eight million very quickly which was exciting times, it, it outgrew me and then I went to set up the youth group and my organisation that I run now as the CEO. And I just believe that we live in a world where no one should be left behind. Everyone has skill, everyone has talent, but as employers, we have to do our part to give back to young people, but also for our future businesses so we can succeed. So I'm out there every day talking to a number of young people, working with a number of businesses, saying we need to do more so young people can get ahead talk more about some of the programs you've developed in a, in a second, but you still see yourself as really the bridge between the employer and youth. Youth is still your focus. Totally. You have to, around the table, both parties, meaning the young person and the employer, they both should have a voice. And how you communicate that so they both are aligned is where we come in. We help employers to understand young people and we help young people to understand employers. So then there's a match made in heaven. Absolutely. And speaking of matches made in heaven, you're obviously working very closely with Ben, uh, ben Towers. Also a fascinating story. You're, you're just 21. Um, and I, I did find this amazing line from uh, the well-known businessman Richard Branson, one of the UK's most exciting entrepreneurs. That, that's a heck of an accolade for a 21-year-old. For if, if you could do, Jack, just um, briefly surmise there, give us a little background to your story. How did you become to be in, in that position at, at such a young age? Sure. So when I was 11 years old, I was... I enjoyed computers, always enjoyed technology and so on. And one of my mum's friends is an author, just looked to me and she said to me, you know what, can you build me a website? I'd never built one before in my life, but I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And I literally learned how to do it online. And I think, first thing to note on that, I think quite fascinating, is that somebody challenged me and gave me that sense of direction because until that I was playing with technology, I was doing all these different things. But to have somebody say to me, actually, you know what, can you use the skill you've, that you've got to actually do something of value. And so I built this website, and at the end she went, that's brilliant, here's 50 pounds, like 100 New Zealand dollars. And I was like, oh, brilliant. I went straight to the sweet shop, spent it all, and so on, and I was like, I now need more money. And initially it was, I was money driven, I'd say, when you're 11, you know, that's what you think about, really. But over time we started to grow this into a business, age 13, then started to employ people, and 
like when I was 16, became a first ever person to employ himself as an apprentice in my own business. And that was because I wanted to be full time in the company, but also be able to be in education and abide by the law and so on. And it got to a point, long story short, I was 18 years old, had 26 staff in this company, moved more from websites into marketing. And our work was really specialised in engaging young people in social media campaigns. So what we'd normally do is you'd have an existing marketing company who would take hold of a wider work for these businesses. And then we'd then look at the real, the young arm of that. You know, brands who are working for like intercontinental hotels, Virgin Racing, and you know, some really a lot for the government as well, and some really big brands. And the thing about Richard Branson story as well, so I think for me, like, in, or like most young people, we often have these idols or people we look up to in business and so on, or any different industry who are like, you know what, I just love what they're all about. And for me, Richard Branson was always one of those, always somebody I looked at, the lifestyle he's built for himself, and always thought, you know what, that's what I love, the fact you can do that. And you know, there's some random statistics about him, like he's one of the largest funders of drug rehabilitation in America. You know, he's always, He's done a lot in charity as well. And I always found that fascinating and something that I always loved. And that thing he said about me came from after he mentored me and gave me a lot of support, both growing the company and giving that direction. And he remember this article about me, but just one of those moments in your life where you're just like, wow, you know what, to have someone who I've always looked up to, to publicly say, you know what, you're, you're doing something quite interesting. It's always even now, I never feeling it was always something I was amazed at, but I think it motivated me a lot more, and it's something we can do a lot more to young people, which they actually give them that motivation and celebration. Yeah, absolutely. So many, so many themes there, and obviously the big crossover. What Jack was talking about. You talked about mentor. You talked about um, meaning in life. Yeah. Actually, that's the motivating factor. When you look around the world now, obviously in the last couple of years, it feels like there's been a bit of a sea change, and rather than um, sort of. People find it difficult to find, um, or people to find jobs. It's almost difficult for employers to find those workers, isn't it? And this is quite a quite a shift. And then we've got the mental health. You know, we're talking about the future of work, aren't we? You must be sort of right in the middle of a lot of those themes. Yeah. So what I then did, age eighteen, I exited from that marketing company. Now I'm twenty one, and I'm working on a solution to really look at how can we help mental health within the workplace. Because I think we all know the statistics. The public and how that affects people on an individual basis, but there's also a massive economic cost to employers. And when you actually look at young people, you look at the rise in mental health challenges being faced by young people now, day, day in, day out, it's actually saying, so what can an employer do to help address and support that, which then makes it a lot better for the, both the employer from a business, but also helps invest in your staff and help them in, as an individual basis. And, that is all the whole premise behind that is building communities of people. It's trying to actually bring like-minded people together based around their health to say, look, you can support each other. You're not doing life alone. And it's something, because of the social media world we now live in, I think we feel connected but also disconnected. We have all these friends online, but reality, when something goes wrong, we don't have all these friends to call on. And that's just trying to change that and say, actually, you know what? You can have close friends in your workplace who you know you're working with, but you can go to them if something goes wrong, you need support and so on. Michael, if I could bring you in here, obviously a lot, a lot of the themes that are crucially important for you, the members and just business across the country. What, what do you see as some of the biggest issues that some of your members or business uh, are facing um, in relation to these this youth issues and getting these people, attracting them, recruiting them, and also retaining them, which I guess is key for business? Yes, yeah, so I think that um there's been an inversion occur because for so long um, employers have been able to sit there and they had all the choice. And um, today that's different. Today they're reaching out and they're trying to encourage uh, young people um, to find them attractive. So I go back to what Jack said before when he said everybody should have a say. And I think it's time now for employers to be able to say, um, you know, this is the environment that we can offer, but they need to listen to the environment that youth want to have. And if we can do that, we're going to be able to entice more people into the workplace. We're going to be able to attract um, more apprentices to come in and to join us. But it's going to take both parties to listen to each other. And that's, you know, that's what I see coming out of this conversation. Exactly, very well put. Lovely answer. And in fact, it ties in, um, Jack, you've obviously developed some materials and a programme to address 
this, these exact issues, that inversion of the, of, the, of, the, of the different challenges that employees are facing. Tell us a little about some of your programs. You also work with Buckingham Palace, um, but also tell us about the, the Youth the Employer Youth Ready uh, program. So employers are really busy. They've got a business to run. They've got hires to bring in. How can they really dedicate some time and be their own experts in how to bring young people into the organisation? So when we sat there, we thought to ourselves, how can we create some tools that were light touch, micro learning, where employees can jump on and educate themselves, see how they can help more young people coming into the organisation on their own terms in their own time. So these tools are for employers to dip dive into understanding, connecting, attracting, recruiting and developing young people and all employers are at different stages. Some have the connection part spot on because they've got a great brand to showcase but they might not be good at the development part so this is where employers can, at whatever stage they are in at their business in terms of youth, they can jump on and say, actually, we're not really good at retaining young people, so this part here will be brilliant for us. And what a better way to do that than doing that digitally, doing that online. I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of parachute projects. I like things to be scalable. I like things to work. So this is an opportunity to work with the Ministry of Social Development and the Auckland Chamber to really bring it to life here in New Zealand. Ben, you would have, you would have come across some of these issues in your own businesses, yeah. you know, face to face. And what a big one um, we've sort of noticed in the news media a lot is that retention issue. You might actually be able to get the young person in there, but they're, you know, hang on, how do you hang on to them? What do, you, what do you guys bring into the table that actually advice and, and ways that employers can help with that, that issue? I think it's just often a misconception that, you know, put a few slides in the office, put a few bouncy castles and all these random things and then people will be buzzing to come and work at the company. But the reality was a lot more to that. There's a lot more changes that need to be made. And that's not saying that businesses are completely wrong in that. That's just saying that, you know what, as a young person, they're coming from a very different situation than what people were coming at before. Now, these are the generations now who have grown up online, grown up in social media, grown up in a very different type of environment and culture. And what then happens is then when you try to relate someone like that and bring them into a workplace, is there's now this big difference in what they're used to day to day to now what they're used to when they try and get into work. And that then causes challenges from both sides. You know, it's not just saying it's all on one side, it's, I think it's challenges on both. And that's where it's trying to look at a case of what can be done to help the young people upskill themselves and be ready to even hold down a job in some cases. Then what can be done from an employer's point of view to say, you know what, employing young people isn't a, a charity or a CSR project we're doing, it's actually us investing in the future and this is what we need to change about the, as us as an employer to make sure we're ready for that change but also embrace it. You know, the beauty of bringing in people from these different backgrounds and different ways of looking at things is you're now bringing diversity into your workplace and you, if you're a whatever sort of company you're in, your consumers are going to benefit from having a diversity within your team producing the products and services, whatever it is you're doing. And that's authentic, right? We're not, we get so far away from tokenism here, right? This is, this is what the modern business practices they need to be doing, right? Um, obviously, you, you've been nodding your head there. <laughs> Clearly, there's a lot of issues you're talking about here. Get, take us back, and how did you meet these two? And then what was the impetus and the, the, uh, the, the reason you actually wanted to bring them out here and, and get them involved with what, the work you're doing? Um, I met them through the Ministry of Social Development um, and some of the, the programs that were associated with. Um, but when they told their story about um, youth-ready employers, I found it such a compelling story and easy to understand. So when I have a look at um, you know, the conversation that we've just had about um, attracting youth into employment or employers having a better understanding, um, neither party needs to make a huge change, right? We can all change a little bit. We can all change our behaviours. And if we change our behaviours, we're going to end up with better employers and better employees, a better workplace. So um, to me, having that conversation with them a couple of months ago and then having the opportunity to bring them out here to New Zealand and be a part of a conversation change that will be a behaviour change for employers and employees 
That's what the chamber wanted to be a part of. We'll get you to sum up where those resources can be found uh, a little later. But what were some of the, the, the big thing, the big individual aspects that you hope these guys can help businesses with? What are some of the, the main difficulties you're seeing when it comes to those attraction, recruitment and retention issues? I think some of it's about the first conversation that we have <laughs> with employers, uh, with employees. Um, and part of that first conversation is uh, um, understanding you know, the young person today understanding the way that they think and the environment that they live in and the way that they want to work, the flexibility that they might want, um, the dissuaders that we often put into advertising and so on. And yet when I have a look at employment today in New Zealand, um, what we're finding is that it's increasingly difficult to find the right people for the, for the right roles. And yet if we could engage those people, if we could get them into our workplaces, we can train them, we can build up their knowledge and ability and capability. Um, so to me, uh, you know, it is a, a great opportunity for change, but it's, it's recognising a problem that we have in New Zealand at the moment, and that's engagement. So to me, first big thing is engagement. Uh, be prepared to invest in people and look to play a long game, not a short game. I love what you said about the dissuaders, and they might be... Uh, unknown, they might be at a subconscious level, the, the employer, Jack, might not even know that the way they're, they're running a recruitment ad or doing something when the person's in that work, that they're actually not connecting with it. They don't even know they're doing it right. This must be something you come up against. It's the famous saying, you don't know what you don't know. Yes. And the same for employers. They just don't understand or... And it's not that they want to do something different, it's just that they don't know. You have to lift an employer up for do it trying and putting a job out there for the young person. We have to say yes, firstly. We have to lift them up. But most importantly, who's going to tell them? How are they going to grow and actually get real nurtured young talent from disadvantaged communities into their business, for instance, if they just don't understand how to connect with them? And it goes back to Michael's and Ben's point. Listening is so important. Yeah? When you talk about retain, how do you actually retain a young person? It's by giving them a voice. There's a statistic in the UK that only 4% of leaders actually get to hear about the problems grassroots on the ground in their business. 4%. So what's happening to the other 96% of the issues? This is why they're losing people. This is why they're losing, losing young people. And secondly, you can't just put a slide in the office to say, oh, we've got a slide and a bean bag, everything's fine. Now, that is a good perk. And if you're going to put a slide in the office, brilliant, do it. However, that shouldn't be the only strategy that you have. It's, we need to really, really bring the two together. And that is the message here. Bring the two voices together from the young person and the employer and really come together to understand how is this going to work? Ask the question, how is this going to work? And most businesses here in New Zealand, they're small businesses. They haven't got an HR department or a receptionist. So it's how can you make it work for the small business? And this is why these, re these resources and these tools are easy to read, easy to understand, and quick, quick implements. Like Michael said, it's not much that you need to change. There's little bits. And even if you only change one part today, you can work on part two tomorrow. And, and such a crucial, this is a growing issue, isn't it? We, we're going to be, this is not just something we've seen for this year and next. That matching up between that huge and, and, and critical wasted resource, that is young people who, who might be not in education or tertiary education or employment, that's a, that's a resource that's been wasted if we can't get them in. Obviously, the um, Auckland Business Chamber and MST, the Ministry of Social Development, have a large link over there, don't they? One's trying to help the business, one's trying to get those, those young people into those jobs and out of those sort of dead-end environments. And it is a waste of resource, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, I think that you look at the economic situation this now creates, you know, it now creates an environment where young people want a job or they want to have that sense of purpose, even if they don't know it's a job right now. But then because of maybe the fact that the way the employers are talking about it, the way employers are marketing or putting their job adverts out, or the opportunities young people are being given to be upskilled and trained are matching up. And so that's why it's taking this two-pronged approach to say, OK, so what can the government do and maybe the people around the government? Then what can employers do? 
And by having that two part and the good beauty behind all these resources is you know what is looking at both sides. It's not just going from one side and blaming the other one. It's actually going to be looking at both different angles and say, so what can be done here and what can be done there? And if they're both done, that in theory should create a lot better synergy, which will now create a nicer pathway and stop young people from you know, having to rely on the government for, for, for longer support or even sometimes leaving the country to seek opportunities elsewhere. Because I think reality is there's so many opportunities here on the ground in New Zealand. There's no need to have to travel around to find that. And I think it's making young people aware of that and making employers also aware of quite the goal they have within their company that could really help a young person. If I could ask both of you, you know, we, we obviously we've come here to New Zealand to help out here and, we'll, and we will talk about that a little more. Before we do, what about in the UK? What are some of the, what are some of the examples and best success stories and th that you've had to date, some of the programmes you've been involved with? So let me start. There was this young, this young lad and he sent his CV, very persistent, wanted to get a job. And there was something about him. He had a bit of flair, he had a bit of energy. He didn't have any experience, none at whatsoever. But he had something about him. And he came to me and said, Jack, will you help me? And the way he worded his Instagram message, there was something in his message that I said, you know what, I'm gonna deal with this directly because this young person, I see a bit of myself in him when I was trying to get a job. And I said, right, I'm gonna get you an interview. Where do you wanna work? He said, I wanna work for one of the big consultancies. I said, okay. Let's, that's a good start. So with my connections at EY, Ernest & Young, in the UK, we, we connected him in to get an interview for an early careers job. And he called me. He said, Jack, I'm not going. And I said, why are you not going? I've just worked hard to try and get you an interview. What, what, why are you not going? And getting to the bottom root cause of why he said he didn't want to go yeah, yeah, was... You, you, you're to listen, right? You listen. you listen. The reason was is that he couldn't afford a suit. And they want me to go through these shiny doors and I can't afford a suit. So that was the first barrier that we added to overcome. Now, employers don't really understand what it takes for a young person to get to an interview. The second issue was that he couldn't afford the travel to get to the other side of London. So one side of London to another side, he just couldn't afford to get across to London. So, OK, no worries, I'll have one of my team to bring you an oyster. Then the third issue was this on is the, the day. Local travel card, yes, right? yeah. the local travel card. The first third issue is that he got to the door of this big EY building, and the doors were going round and round and round. But he had no exposure whatsoever to walk in those doors because he had all these people coming out with suits. He was nervous. He was scared. He's never been in that environment before. And he called me. He said, "I'm not doing it." I said, "Where are you?" He said, "I'm outside." So what we did is that we spoke to the recruitment team at EY and I, we said, look, there's this young person, I'm dedicated to getting him a job. Will you step outside the office and meet him and interview him in a local coffee shop where he feels comfortable? They was a bit hesitant at first, but they said yes. That young guy got, went on to get the job. Now, the, the magical thing here is Ernest and Young in the UK now ask, do you feel comfortable coming into our offices? Would you like to interview, would you like us to interview somewhere else? Or actually, can you afford to get here? And it's those simple questions that that employer are now asking. And we've seen an increase in their diversity. We've seen an increase in the type of young person they're hiring. And it's just so simple. Like Michael said, not much change is needed. And this is why I'm so excited to be here and be invited to New Zealand. We've been working with the Ministry of Social Development. Uh, the Minister for Employment, Willie Jackson, has come grassroots on the ground in the UK to see the work that we're doing. So this is not a parachute project where we're flying in, launching a program, having some sand bites and leaving. This is something grassroots that we've been working in the background with, with the social, Ministry of Social Development. I came last year, I see the fantastic work uh, that the Auckland Chamber was doing on the ground with young people last year as well. So we've been building up to this and that is why it's so exciting. Yeah, it's a great example, isn't it? Because it's, on one level, it is so simple, but yet it is actually represents quite a sea change. For an employer, as you said before, what you, you don't, know, don't know what you don't know, but to actually have it to them, put those questions, get that thought process going and how to make it approachable must be key. And I guess, Michael, this is what you want these guys here to do. This is what, to raise awareness amongst your members and the wider business community 
of these types of issues. I think, as I said before, their message is compelling. And, you know, businesses aren't going to be able to have business as usual. We need change. And if we are going to have change, we need to do something different. What these guys are bringing to New Zealand is something that's proven. So they can bring it here, they can share their resources with us, we can make those resources available free of charge to the New Zealand business community, and that's what we will do. And been so many issues wrapped up in this. I mean, I mentioned the term the future of work a lot around the world. That, that's what people are talking about. And there's, there's a lot to that. Obviously, you've got climate change, you've got youth under or unemployment, you've got mental health issues. I guess it all wraps in, and you've been a, you are and have been a businessman. You would have seen this in your own in the own context. Are you thinking of this bigger picture or are you, are you quite targeting just the young people here? So when we look at the bigger picture and we're really trying to look at how it all comes together. And I'll give you a story actually that relates to Jackson, but look at it from the other side of things as well, is you get these groups of young people who have got tremendous amounts of skill and knowledge that are built by themselves. And in this case, I'm talking about some of the work that I do in the UK, the police. So that is trying to find young people who are really, really, really gifted and skilled in computers and more namely in this case, hacking and how it can get through systems and so on. And in the UK, and it's pretty similar across um, the developed worlds as well, that one in four young people at some point whilst at school will try and hack into their school's internet system, just out of fun. Mm -hmm. And that could be from trying out their teacher's password to really getting in and taking down printers and software and so on. And so it's trying to look at that and go, you know what, there's also young people with massive amount of skill because they're sitting at home playing computer games and they're really starting to nurture and becoming so intelligent about this space. And in this case, the police and we were working with them on doing is to attract these young people and saying, okay, let's help them direct their skill in a positive way so they don't, they don't end up hacking banks, they end up hacking for the police and doing things ethically and using their skills in large corporates and so on. And the similar when it comes to what we're looking at here is saying, you know what, there is also young people who have got tremendous, tremendous amount of learned knowledge that they've done themselves, if it be in, in, in the case I'm describing, from going online, doing coding courses and so on. And that, I think, where what we're trying to do here is say, actually, for this young person, what can be done just to make them ready to, to work for a company? They've got the skills, they've got the knowledge they need. They might not realise that, but they've often got that. So how can we make them aware of they need to turn up on time? They need to know who to call when they're unwell. We need to know the ethics behind working for a company. And I think that often can be a scary thing for employers to think, oh, why have I got to tell someone that? When you look at the long-term benefit that that could happen, by you saying, you know what, I'm going to invest in a young person. I'm going to understand they might have to be taught some of those skills. But longer term, they could become a very, very, very influential and powerful member of staff in that company because you're employing them for their skill or potential for skill and realising that the, the work-ready knowledge is very easy to teach in comparison to the actual skill needed to do the job. It's a great example and of course that applies to, to everybody coming out of school or university, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think you know you can go to university, spend loads of time developing these amazing skills and I think there's still then that gap between being highly skilled but then going to get your first job and maintaining that and developing and thinking about your future career. So I think that the idea behind these documents is, yes, is looking at some of those hard to reach young people. It's also looking at those who have been through a lot more education, maybe a, a bit more ready skill-wise to get a first job but now it's going okay, so how can we bring them in and how can you also as an employer get the most out of them as well because I think it's easier to bring them in but actually go okay so what they're bringing in is something very different to what you've got at the moment so how can we really learn and use that to the full advantage. We've touched on a few examples there Jack but what about you what's your top tip for entrepreneurs and for business people businesses to actually be more youth ready to attract and retain those those youthful staff from whatever background they come from. My top tip for employers would be go from having all the answers to asking all the questions. And these documents, these 150 documents, resources and quick learns will give you those questions that you can then have the conversation with the young person. And it's so important that these documents are to leave no one behind, to leave no youth behind, no young New Zealander behind. And that's, that's why you've come to New Zealand, to, to launch this programme, to get these documents out there into the business community to help the businesses 
help themselves of the young people. It goes from how to write a youth first job description to how to retain a young person in the organisation. These toolkits will really help you and help the employer to really understand young people, connect to young people, recruit young people, develop and definitely retain. And that is what it's all about. Ben, what about you when you're out and about in the business community? How do you describe this, this tool, these, this resource and these materials? I think there are some things in the resources you may look at it and be like, oh, I get that, we already do that. And I think this is designed to give you that overarching way of thinking and go, you know what, some of these things you might already be doing. So I think the best way of looking at this toolkit is you're going, OK, I've read it all. These are the three things we're going to focus on for this year. These are going to be our three focuses to really develop and build from, and then next year we'll look at the next three, because I think if you try and change it all right now, it's going to be too much. But I think the brilliant thing behind this is when you've got the government and the chamber all looking behind this and say, look, what can we do to really support this? It now means this isn't the end. This is just the start. And I think this means that this toolkit can develop and change over time and start to become something so relevant that it becomes almost the, the go-to place for your questions. Nice. And Michael, your business New Zealand is, is ready, the businesses in New Zealand are ready for this type of resource? Oh, yes, they are. And I think Ben's correct. Um, start the journey, right? Do something today, get it right, do something more and keep on changing because we have to change. And where can, where can business find these, these documents? Um, Aucklandchamber.co.nz forward slash youth ready employers. Okay, and it's ready to go. It's ready to go. Uh, we'll have some resources there now and um, then we'll be adding to those progressively over the next few months. Jack, Ben and Michael, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you.